So this is a talk about pilot studies and why do we have pilot studies or if we should have pilot studies. And I think at this point I will repeat things that you already know, but maybe hopefully it will make more sense. Um, when I was preparing this talk or when we were talking about this talk, we thought that there will be maybe like 15, 20 students, our students our researchers, and that it will be rather sort of a discussion what people encounter and how people think about uh, pilot studies. So it's a slightly bigger room, but we can still, if you have any questions or you want to say something, just raise your hand and we can discuss. This talk will have three parts. It's like a musical. The first part is very long, the second part is shorter, and the third part is like really, really short. So it's going to get better. The first part is more about what we think about pilot studies, FX size and p-values, and it's kind of a almost like a simulation to show you what can happen in pilot studies. It was uh, designed together with my collaborators, Drs. Nunes, Campbell, and who, and we have worked on it a while ago. So the objective, first of all, is to figure out what can happen in pilot studies. And what I have here is a, is a quote from a paper by Helena Kramer from 2006 that I will be using partially in this talk. And the paper came in a Archives of General Psychiatry and it's about caution regarding the use of pilot studies to guide power calculations for study proposals. So 2006 is pretty old, but it takes a while for the general public and researchers and grant reviewers to kind of accept the changes, so it takes a t so it's sort of still relevant. She says that clinical researchers often propose pilot studies to determine whether a study is worth performing and guide power calculations. So that's a problem because the most likely outcome are that studies worth performing are aborted and studies that are not aborted are underpowered. So basically using pilot studies to sort of guide a power calculation for large RCT could be and often is very flawed and will always result in either underpowered studies or studies that we cannot perform because we would need too many subjects in there. So in this first part, I will try to illustrate that on an example, these are real data that we had from a study, large 507 subjects clinical trial. This clinical trial was performed in a CTN under NIDA network. It had 10 sites that were sort of carefully selected and <coughs> two arms. One arm was like a clinical intervention. It was a computer delivered behavioral inter intervention and the other one was treatment as usual, usual. And it was for substance abuse. So the outcome was uh, being abstinent from substance abuse. So first we will talk a little bit about hypothesis testing and how this is related. And then we will talk about what if we had a pilot study for this trial, which would be one of those 10 sites. And what it would lead to, would we have, would a site as a pilot study be enough to actually estimate the FX size and compute the sample size for future RCT? So what was the study about? We had a two-arm randomized 12 weeks long clinical trial. The first arm was a treatment as usual. The second arm was treatment combined with a therapeutic educational system. So I'm just going to call it TRX here because it's not about the particular trial. It's about how to compute sample size or what to do with pilot studies. Just as a for an interest, uh, the therapeutic education system was approximately two hours a week and it was on computer and it was sort of delivered to the subjects on their own time. So it was comparable to the same amount of face-to-face -face counseling and we wanted to know because it's sort of more subject specific if it's better than the treatment as usual. So our primary hypothesis was that the treatment, the specific treatment, will significantly increase the odds of abstinence in the last four weeks of the study compared to treatment as usual. 
So why last four weeks of the study, we were assuming that they sort of will become maybe more and more abstinent until whatever was supposed to happen to them in the last four weeks, it will be stable. So we can just look at the last four weeks, whether they are abstinent or not. And the outcome was the abstinence, which is binary outcome, yes, no, from either drug use or heavy drinking. So not any drinking, but heavy drinking in the last four weeks of the trial. So this is just for our interest because in my talk, I will approach pilot studies from more the statistical point of view. So this is to me treatment and placebo, two-arm study, outcome is binary. So our primary hypothesis was that we were hoping that our treatment will, be, will significantly increase the odds of abstinence at the last four weeks of study compared to treatment as usual. So this is the hypothesis we're hoping for. We're hoping that our treatment is significantly better than placebo. But in order to test that, our prim primary aim has to test hypotheses, which are null and alternative hypotheses. And the null hypothesis will be that treatment and placebo do not differ, that they are the same in abstinence rates in the last four weeks of the study. And the alternative hypothesis has to be two-sided. I cannot say alternative hypothesis that we will have better treatment than placebo, but I can only say that the two treatments, treatment as usual, and whatever the treatment we're proposing will differ in abstinence rates during the last four weeks of the study. So in this case, we have to admit that there is also a possibility that our treatment will be significantly worse than placebo. It is not out of the question, so that's why we have to have a two-sided hypothesis test. Two-sided hypothesis test, it's called because the alternative hypothesis says different than, and different could be worse, or it could be better. So it actually encompasses both potential tails of the distribution. We would like to have a one-sided hypothesis test because in terms of power, one-sided hypothesis tests have always more power than two-sided hypothesis tests. But in order to have one-sided hypothesis test, we would have to actually show and prove that the other side is not possible, that it is absolutely impossible to have our treatment significantly worse than placebo or treatment as usual, which it's not possible to prove. Uh, sometimes there is a small possibility or there is a chance that you can have one-sided hypothesis test. I saw it once in a clinical trial about children where they were actually trying to see whether the children grow or whether their growth is stunned. But they can't kind of shrink. So in that case, one-sided hypothesis test is helpful, and one-sided hypothesis test will always improve power because we have to only care about the one side of the hypothesis test, so we have more power. So that's useful, but most likely will not happen. So our hypothesis is uh, that we are hoping that our treatment is significantly better than placebo based on the abstinence rates in the last four weeks of the study, and we will perform hypothesis test. Now the hypothesis test will have two endings, two potential endings. Either we don't reject no hypothesis, that means that we didn't find significant difference between the two treatment arms, or we do reject null hypothesis, and that is the happy occasion, because if we reject null hypothesis, notice that our null and alternative hypothesis were covering all the bases what can happen. So if I reject the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis must be true. So in this case, if we reject null hypothesis, we actually prove or show that we have enough evidence or the data provide enough evidence that the treatment and placebo arm are significantly different, hopefully in a correct decision. But that might not be the actual truth. The truth, the real truth that we will never really know, but we are trying to find out, is that either the treatment is not better than placebo, treatment as usual, or the treatment is truly better or at least different. So what happens now? We have the truth and we have what 
we get from the hypothesis test. If the treatment is not better and we don't reject no hypothesis, it's a sad moment, but it's the correct moment. The treatment was not better than placebo or treatment as usual, and we did not reject no hypothesis, so we technically have nothing to talk about. Yes? Sorry to go back. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, to what you said about the one-sided and two-sided. Yeah. If the chance is high that my treatment is worse than the placebo, the IRB will not approve the study. True. True. If but there when are... Do I decide when does, when, what gives me enough confidence to, be, to choose a one-sided T-test? Uh, technically, you really cannot by NIH guidelines use one-sided hypothesis unless the other side is impossible. So that means chance of it happening has to be exactly zero. Like children cannot shrink. Like that really cannot happen. But otherwise there is no way you will have to always perform a two-sided hypothesis test. And now it is true that we would not get an IRB if IRB suspected that our treatment is worse than placebo. But actually, in my career here, it does, did happen that we gave a treatment to substance abusing population, and that treatment had similar side effects as withdrawal symptoms, and they actually ended up smoking marijuana much more <laughs> than the placebo. Um, it was a valuable result, actually, because we showed that this particular SSRI should not be given to marijuana smoking population because it induces even more smoking significantly than sugar pill. But that's, no one suspected that. We didn't know ahead of time. But am I answering your question? Technically, it's very rare to actually be able to give one-sided hypothesis test, to have one-sided hypothesis test on a grant application. Extremely rare, and it's only in the cases that you can show that the other side cannot happen under any circumstances. Not that it's not plausible, but it cannot happen. Sorry. But then if you could, it's a better power, but extremely, extremely rare. So most of the times we talk about two-sided hypothesis tests. And in those two-sided hypothesis tests, if we really, if the treatment is not so much better than placebo and we don't reject no hypothesis, it's the correct answer in a hypothesis test. It's not very exciting. We have to think about better treatment or how to enhance our treatment, but it's, it's an answer. What can, however, happen is that the treatment is not better than placebo, but by some kind of random chance, our subjects line up so badly that we actually reject no hypothesis. In this case, we actually have a problem. It's an error. The hypothesis test didn't give us the truth because rejecting no hypothesis means saying that treatment is significantly better than placebo or significantly different than placebo. So the type 1 error means that the treatment was found erroneously superior to treatment as usual or placebo. Now, the opposite error happens in this quadrant where actually treatment is significantly better than placebo, but we failed to find it significantly different, so we didn't reject null hypothesis. That is a different error than this type 1 error, and so we are very boring people. We call it type 2 error. We just enumerate them. And the type, type 2 error is treatment is found erroneously not superior. So in case we really want to have a study designed in such a way that both type 1 and type 2 error are as minimal as possible. We don't want to perform them. The happy quadrant, this is where we get to really start smiling, is if treatment is truly better and our study found it significantly different or significantly better than placebo. That's actually called power, how often it happens, and that's a probability that treatment is found correctly superior. Now, if treatment is truly better, then we can have only two options happening. If the treatment is truly better, we either find it better, which is power, or we don't, which is type 2 error. 
So the type 2 error and power are actually inversely related to each other, that they together sum 200%, nothing else can happen to bad treatment that is better than placebo, either type 2 error or power. So in this case, we really, if we are in charge of type 2 error, it means we are in charge of power. Or, in other way, if we are in charge of power, we are in charge of type 2 error. So we need to be in charge of just two things, the type 1 error and the power, because through backwards relationship, we are affecting the type 2 error too. So uh, what causes the errors? The errors are usually caused by random chance, and random chance is something that we cannot really affect. It's how the subjects come into our study. Randomly, I can have 10 really great subjects, or I can have randomly 10, 15 subjects who can't be helped. Um, so random sampling or random chance is not perfect, and it can accidentally happen that my tr t treatment will be favored when truly is not superior. Maybe my treatment is very similar to placebo, but I will have accidentally great subjects in a treatment group and not so great people in a placebo group. So the treatment group will look better than the placebo. Oppositely, it can happen too. My treatment could be really, really superior, but all the bad subjects that can't be helped and really cannot become abstinent will end up in my treatment group and all the easy to be abstinent subjects will be in a placebo group. And suddenly, even though my treatment was superior, the randomization worked out in such a way that it doesn't appear that my treatment is significantly better than placebo. You can have analogy with flipping a coin. You can have a perfect fair coin and flip it 10, 15 times if you flip it 10 times, it could happen that we will have two hats and eight tails. And it will appear that the coin is not fair, even though it's just random chance. On the other hand, if you go to Las Vegas, you can actually find and buy biased coins. You can get their coins with two hats and no tail or whatever. But if you have just a biased coin that has a head and tail, you can have that coin which is very unfair, flip it 10 times, and just by random chance, observe five heads and five tails. And it will seem like it's fair. It can work both ways. So that's what we have to avoid. Unfortunately, that random sampling is never perfect, and the only way how we can sort of combat that imperfection is having larger samples. In a small samples, these imperfections cannot be averaged out. So here we have, if we reject no hypothesis, that is a type 1 error, and that means that the data favor erroneously the treatment. The type 2 error means exactly opposite. Data erroneously don't provide enough evidence that treatment is superior. Truly, the coin is unfair, but it looked like 50-50 when we flipped it 10 times. And the power is really the great moment where the data align with the truth, so that means data correctly provide enough evidence that treatment is superior. So how we can combat that, and this is the end of this uh, small, boring uh, sample hypothesis testing moment is that we actually pre-select. What do we pre-select? Most of the times we pre-select level of significance. We pre-select level of significance to be 5%. Uh, someone once asked me, or students always ask me, why 5%, why not 4 And my only explanation of 5% is because we have five fingers. And as humans, we like number 5 and 10. If you know better, um, I don't have anything better. So we pre-select the level of significance, 5%, that's the alpha. And additionally, NIH or any granting agency usually requests that we have a high power of our study. The high power of our study usually should be at least 80%, some granting agencies or some different one, 90%. So that is the other side. So we are looking for power to have at least 80, 90%, and we look for what sample size can warrant that certain power of 80 or 90%. So here we have, 
the type one error is always bounded by the level of significance. So when we pre-selecting the level of significance, we say nothing else than we will hold the type one error up to 5%. Because what is the type 1 error? Type 1 error is that the treatment is not better, but we accidentally find it significant. And that's the error people are more afraid about because they don't want to come out with a treatment that truly is not better, but just accidentally seemed significant. And that is why we select this very strict type 1 error bound level of significance, usually 5%. Then here we have the type 2 error, with some funky bracket, don't know where did it go. And we usually, oh, we usually select the type two error by selecting power. If we select the power to be at least 80%, because they are type two error and power complement to each other, that means that the type two error will be less or equal to 20%. Now what is a type two error? Type 2 error is that my treatment is truly better, but my sample size will stack up in such a bad way that it will look like it's similar to placebo. That is a sad moment because I have a great treatment in my hands. I believe it as an expert and medical professional, but my data just don't show it enough. So to have chance of that happening 20%, it's actually pretty high. So if we cheat on power, we actually cheat on ourselves in a type two, type 2 error. So having a high power is not something to satisfy the agency, but having a high power gives us a certainty that if we truly have a great treatment, the data are likely to show it. Because type 2 error 20% is, you know, not that great, so we would like to have it smaller or as small as possible. So now I will show you what can happen if we select different sample sizes or sort of, um, it's not really a simulation, it's based on a real data. And it's based on the data from the clinical trial I was talking about, which had like 500 subjects, 507 subjects, and it was based on 10 sites. I'm not allowed to tell you which 10 sites, but I can show you a picture. Uh, well, so we had, uh, these are substance abuse providers, well, addiction clinics, like not getting them addicted, but de-addicted. Um, and one is in Florida, Texas, Hawaii, uh, Washington State, Oregon, Illinois, or Indiana. Those are the states you always fly over. And then, then there is a East. So we have 10 sites. Now let's pretend that we can actually select one of those sites and use it as our pilot study. Because it was a real, real, uh, real experiment, I actually have the data. I pre-calculated, if you select, for instance, site number one as your pilot study, you will have there 41 subjects. And I pre-calculated what will be the odds ratio and how many, you know, how that particular site one pilot study would inform the future randomized clinical trials if we use it in that way. So if you look at those sites, and hopefully now I can have a mouse and I can click on it, um, if you look at these sites, which site would you like to have as your pilot study? Which you said? Well, all of them are done. All of them are done. So that is the beauty. It's not simulated in a computer. These are real subjects, really analyzed, and basically we are just selecting which site we would like to select as a pilot study. Yes? Yes, exactly. If all is equal and we don't know what will happen, then pretty much we want the site that is most careful, site where they will follow our protocol, a nice site, and the highest sample size. Uh, I forgot to click, so here we will, I will run basically once we select the site, I will run the study, I will analyze, it's already done, the logistic model for abstinence, and we actually additionally control for baseline drug abstinence and baseline stimulator, stimulant use. Those were basically things. What I will provide you is with sample loss ratio, 
what would that site came out, and potential sample size for future RCT if we use it in the old way as, as we did. So you said the largest, uh, largest site. Now you will see that I cannot actually tell which number is the largest. Three. Okay, so well, hopefully it works. Yes. So here we are, site number three. This is actually what happened. Site number three had 60 subjects. Uh, the odds ratio that came out of the site number three was 2.54. So if we actually chose, and that is a very luxurious pilot study, isn't it? So if we actually choose, uh, chose site three as a pilot study, we had 60 subjects, the pilot odds ratio would be 2.54, the 95% confidence interval, you see is still pretty wide, is a 0.66 to uh, 9.83, so it's a very wide confidence interval, but you know, it is what it is. The p-value is almost significant, and now if we use this particular odds ratio, to compute for 80% power and alpha 5%, how many subjects we propose to have in a large RCT, that particular odds ratio would suggest that for the large future RCT, R01 RCT, we should have 188 subjects in both, together in both arms. Here is additionally how I computed the power. This is a little bit of power calculation. The power calculation depends on two things. The odds ratio we have selected, and additionally, the, odds the proportion of abstinence in placebo group. You always have to have one more information because you have two groups, so there are two unknowns. So we need to have two knowns to be able to perfectly get. So here, uh, we usually get 25% of abstinence in a treatment as usual or in placebo groups just because people get abstinence just to show up in a clinic and kind of think about it. So for 25% abstinence and odds ratio 2.54, we would suggest to have a RCT, the old way, if we did it, 188 subjects. All right. Interesting site, what would we want to see? What if I click on site number four? Site number four is the smallest site. So smaller and smaller the site is, what do you expect will happen to that particular site odds ratio? It will become much more volatile because smaller and smaller site, more and more the random chance is winning. We don't combat the random chance by averaging it out so much because we don't have that many subjects to average out. And smaller and smaller pilots are, pilot, pilot study you have, that means more and more, un, more, and more extreme odds ratios can happen. It can fly either way. So look what happened in our site, and I'm telling you, these are real data. They just came out so nicely. Uh, am I clicking right? Yes. On site four, which is the smallest site, look at this odds ratio. It came out absolutely beautiful. And because it was such a small site, that odds ratio, 8.51, is still not significant, but it has incredibly wide confidence interval because it's a very small site. And if I use that particular odds ratio as it is, it will tell me that my next RCT R01 is enough to have 32 subjects. So in this case, I would say, okay, I cannot propose R01 with 32, that's laughable. So I would like raise it to 100, set, you know, power 90. That is the old way, but you can see how it leads to a wrong conclusion. So. I'm not going to torture you with clicking on every side. I can click here on all sides. This is the most uh, complicated slide I ever did. And obviously, it doesn't work. Uh, now, there are all sides. Uh, so here we have the all sides. And you can see one by one how it works out. So our site 3 was 2.54. Our site 4, which is the smallest one, is 8.51. Here we have all the confidence intervals. And here we have side by side. If that was a separate pilot study, what would be the proposal? Like site one ended up in a very tiny odds ratio. So it would, if we use that sample odds ratio to propose an RCT, we would need 1,802 subjects. Impossible. No one will give us enough money for that. However, for instance, the site four will need only 32 subjects. 
However, when we analyze all the sites together, and this is the official result from the clinical trial, that clinical trial ended up being significant. So summing all these 10 sites together, that is together 507 subjects, the odds ratio is 2.25, the overall odds ratio, which is the closest to population true odds ratio, hopefully, we can get. You can see the confidence interval suddenly becomes very narrow and the p-value is significant. We were proposing to, I think, get 550 subjects. We ended up with 507 because some sites didn't recruit as many as they were supposed to. And that was actually enough and it led to correct or correct a significant out of one significant randomized clinical trial. But none of those sites if it was a pilot study, would lead to a correct conclusion and would lead to a correct suggestion of sample size of future RCT. Here is a picture of those, uh, of those odds ratios and sample size. So each side is a one dot. Here you can see this is the 8.51 or 8.70 dot. Yes. Yes, it's because... Um, but, but if each one were to truly... I mean, this is not... This is very well... This, like, you back it up with data, which is great, but this is, you know, most of us know that this actually happens, that the larger your sample size, the better will be your results. But what if you were to split the, your pilot across the 10 sites? It would be the same. Because across the 10 sites, the random chance, it can, again, if I split the pilot across the 10 sites, the odds, what happened? Oh, yeah, you want to repeat the question. So what would happen if the pilot study would not be just one site, but all 10 sites, and basically we would have five people from each site? But again, random chance works exactly the same way. If I selected 50 people, the odds ratio, the split of around 50 people, the odds ratio um, interval from where to where the odds ratio of 50 people across 10 sites can be, will be exactly similar to that. So that's basically, if I was doing simulations, I can simulate and show it to you. Um, yeah. Yes or no? All right. So we're going now further. Here is a suggestion that the sites are heterogeneous and that heterogeneity has to be part of the study. Yes. No. So can we drop an outlier? I'm just repeating your questions, but I have to start answering. So first of all, we cannot drop outliers. We cannot drop outliers. We cannot drop a site just because it's different. Because one different site out of 10 might be that there is hundreds of those types of sites across the United States. So it's an important part of the population. Uh, second of all, it's probably an outlier because of its small sample size and because if you were thinking about the variation in odds ratios that you can find dependent on the sample size, that variation sort of will get wider and wider as we get smaller and smaller sample size. If the sample size is very small, we can really observe extreme results. And as the sample size increases, that variation of that potential odds ratio decreases, decreases, and gets closer and closer to the true population odds ratio that we are hunting for. Now, our point is to get to the true population odds ratio, and I agree with you that in order to persuade you, I should follow up and create a simulation where I will randomly simulate uh, 50 subjects across all those 10 sites many times, compute the odds ratios, and show you nice histograms of those odds ratios. And it is on the back of my mind for several years, and if you have a student who wants to do that, um, I would love, to, love that. But um, it 
in this moment, since I don't have those simulations, you have to trust me that going across the sides might just make it more um, believable. But in terms of statistics, that random chance is still working against us if we have a small sample size. Of course, if the sample size goes close to 500, that confidence interval will get very narrow, and hopefully we are very close to the true odds ratio that we are trying to estimate. So larger and larger sample size does help you, and if we can have a pilot study with 500 subjects, then yes, that would be potentially helpful and informing another RCT, but we can't have pilot study of 500 subjects. It's not called pilot study. Our pilot studies are usually 20 people, 15 people. 30 people if we are lucky. So that is, yes. No, that's come. Sorry, I'm very curious. Please. The, the number that came out as a suggested sample size, are you suggesting this is the total sample size for all 10 sites together? Yes. Because that's 50 per site, and in your pilot study, you have some sites that have more than 50. And yes. That is, so how I computed the number, I came to uh, Columbia in 2004. I started working on clinical trials in 2005, which I consider still being a very dark age. And at that time, the investigators who were much more senior than I was, uh, really came with a FX size from a pilot study. And they said, use this particular FX size that I found in my pilot study, probably using a p-hacking, you know, they were testing millions of things until they got one significant result with odds ratio, maybe 8.5, and they said, uh, use that particular odds ratio from the pilot study and compute how much, how big N do I need to have power 80% for alpha equal 5%. So exactly the same mechanism I used when I was computing the suggested N. This is the old way mechanism what used to be done. Um, now I'm going much longer than I wanted to and that talk gonna get much more fun in a second. But um, so these are bad suggestions and you can see that as the sample size increases we kind of getting closer and closer to the true population odds ratio but it's still very hard so what is the basically conclusion from this is that we shouldn't use pilot studies to inform the large RCT about FX size. We shouldn't use pilot studies and pilot studies results to compute a sample size in RCT because it will never work. If we could estimate FX size from pilot study, then why would we do an RCT? We already estimated the FX size from pilot study. So we're doing the large RCT because we cannot estimate the FX size from pilot study. So I cannot use that FX size from pilot study to compute power or sample size for RCT because that FX size from pilot study can, is very volatile. It can fly from left to right. So what should I do? Large RCT should be powered to detect the smallest FX size that is clinically meaningful. It's all about you as clinicians. If I work with you, I will come to you and say, you tell me what's a clinically meaningful FX size. If uh, average proportion of marijuana or whatever addicted subjects who come to the treatment get abstinent 25%, if the average proportion of abstinence is 25% in a placebo group, what would you consider a successful treatment? 30%? Is 5% per percent more? Don't save people. Would you consider 35%? It will be a different answer than if we talk about how many people are deficient in a vitamin D and treatment for vitamin D deficiency. That sort of clinically meaningful effect size depends on what we're talking about, on your expert opinion. What will make your heart happy? What will make you smile? Is it for going from 25 to 30 percent, from 25 to 35 percent? The smallest possible clinically meaningful effect size is what should be used to power the RCTs, the clinical trials. Pilot studies have limited values. It actually came out in 2013 or 2014 as a part of the uh, announcement for R34 mechanism, and this is literally 
a cut and paste from that announcement when they say pilot studies have limited values. One should not expect statistical significance nor an accurate FX size estimate. So even the NIH is now trying to educate the reviewers in terms of what they should expect from pilot studies. And the success of the future clinical trials should be not based on the FX size estimated from pilot studies because we can't trust the pilot studies. They cannot, they cannot estimate the FX size because they're too tiny. They're too small. If I could estimate the FX size using 50 people, then why would I not do it? Why would I do 500 people clinical trial? So the question arises, and now we got to getting to part two, what are pilot studies for? What are we supposed to do with pilot studies? And now I don't mean only the pilot studies that are, you know, p sort of like paid by NIH or any other granting agencies, but even a pilot study, if you do in your, in your lab, you decide to do a small study, what, what are we should be using them for? And I will mainly talk about those two papers that very nicely summarize it, and they have much better English than I do. And they both, the, a common denominator in both papers has Helena Kramer, who is a really awesome statistician in Washington State. And she's an older lady who really says it how it is. If you have ever possibility to see her talk, I very strongly recommend that. Um, so, uh, why should pilot studies be essential part of the research if we don't use them, don't use their FX size? And where should we get that FX size and p-value? So very shortly, I found that on a internet as sort of a nice pyramid, and it's a nice uh, figure. I have no idea where it was, though. And it basically says how the research should sort of evolve from some sort of a case reports and clinical examples. We should get some kind of expert consensus that there could be a new treatment, there could be a new way how to sort of attack a certain problem. Then we create some observational studies we have. We have some non-experimental studies. We get sort of more expert consensus and clinical opinion. And then we have these RCTs, and then we have to summarize them because we have to do several of them. And then at the end is meta-analysis. I kind of have a problem with that meta-analysis, but this is not a talk about meta-analysis. So our pilot studies are somewhere in here, and the pilot studies are sort of supporting then the future RCT. So pilot studies are still very essential, but what are they supposed to do? And they're supposed to demonstrate feasibility of the treatment, acceptability of the treatment. Is that treatment accepted by subjects? Safety, tolerability. We had a great treatment for substance abuse, how to get them de-addicted, uh, which was highly significant in a lab setting. They used it several times in a lab setting. In a lab setting, it was great. The subjects were doing really well. So we said, OK, we will have an open sort of a clinical trial, a small pilot study. We had 10 or 15 subjects. They all got treatment because we wanted to see how the treatment would look outside of the lab. None of them finished. Because that amount of side effects they were getting at home in a lab, that side effects could have been immediately treated, but they basically all slipped out of the treatment. So even though that treatment was very great in lab setting, in our open sort of uh, open clinical trial setting, uh, this wasn't acceptable by patients. It wasn't feasible to do because they just stopped. None of them finished. So that is a very important lesson to learn, tolerability. So here are some uh, clinical um, outcomes that we can actually measure when we talk about feasibility. We want to know how many people will come to screening. Are we able, how many people we will screen? How many people we can recruit? How many we can randomize? Or how will the randomization work? How can we keep blinding in effect? That is the time to work on the blinding in the pilot study. Uh, by the way, this is all from the first paper, Leon from 2011. Every time there is a little one, that means I'm using that paper so you can find it. And we will send you the slides afterwards, uh, the most important ones, not all that. Um, so, you know, treatment fidelity rates, adherence is very important. If I give the pills to my subjects and send them home, will they really take it or will they sell them on the street? Because we give them really cool pills, so, you know, we never know 
what will happen? How will I measure the adherence? Will a urine test work? Will they come for urine test and so on? Assessment process and so on. These are things I can measure. These are things I can test. This should be a really important part of the clinical trials. Tolerability. I want to know how many side effects will appear. Now, there is a little note that even if you don't see side effects in your pilot study, or some sort of issues, that doesn't mean that your confidence interval is zero to zero. That is sort of the, this rule of three that even if there are, for instance, no side effects detected, which is zero percent, the confidence interval is usually three over n. It's like kind of an estimated upper bound. So that means in a larger trial, I can expect between zero to 10 percent if my pilot had 30 subjects. I'm going through that quickly because you'll get that on slide and it's not that important. But it, if I see zero in my small pilot study, it doesn't mean that no one will get a side effects. It still can happen. My pilot study was very small. So what to do about FX size and power? Pilot study cannot inform the power computation, really, because you will either end up with falsely positive results or falsely negative results. That pilot study has no way of correctly estimating an FX size. So for large RCT, when we create, when we compute power, instead of a pilot study FX size, we use an FX size that has been a clinical opinion to be the smallest possible clinically meaningful FX size. I have to discuss that with my collaborators. They are in charge what they think would be a successful treatment. It's not that the pilot study says it will be this way or that way. Because if pilot study results falsely large FX size like our study number three, then we will actually end up with very small sample sp si size for RCT. If our pilot study will as a, end up in a small FX size, then we will need a huge number of subjects and that thing will never get funded because we will have not enough money. So large well-designed RCT should be powered to find significant clinically meaningful FX size. So I'm just repeating what I said. So in conclusion, you know, the importance of pilot studies is still out there. We still are thinking that it's an essential part of the research but not for estimating FX sizes for RCT. Now, part three is the shortest part. You know how I said we're going to go faster and faster. And part three is about um, what about the grant reviewers? You know, when I came here in 2004 and started writing these really long uh, applications that were still the 30 pages applications before we switched to 12 pages applications, that was a huge you know, space for power and we were doing all these ridiculous computations that all statisticians knew will never come true, but we kind of had to like, like, it was like writing fairy tales, these power sections, especially from pilot study to go to RCT because it was if, you know, once upon a time this happened, then we would potentially have power. So here is a grant application we submitted in 2015. And this was our power analysis. It was for R34, and at that time I was getting smarter, and I was sort of, I knew that, well, the reviewers we will encounter is like this biggest unknown. They could really go by the old way, or they could really go the new way. So we try to educate the reviewers, and this is literally the power section I wrote in a, some kind of R34, and I'm just going to call it XX and YY outcome and population is PP because why not? Uh, and we said there are no previously published trials specifically examining as some kind of a treatment among certain population. The primary purpose of R34 is to conduct a pilot study to affect the F And here I am still kind of trying to be satisfying the old reviewers. So there is a part which sort of like satisfies the old reviewers here I am saying that instead of computing power, we will do 95% confidence intervals because the 95% confidence interval will give me a better idea <coughs> where the FX size can be. And it could be compared to desired clinically meaningful FX size. Uh, but that was not all. But then we said because of the novelty, we were really afraid that someone will want power. So we kind of slid the power in just in case, you know, we tried to satisfy all the reviewers. So we did everything 
potentially the reviewer might say. We're trying to tell them power for pilot study is not proper, but if you want to see pilot, and this was a big pilot study, we had 40 participants per group, we had 80 people. Um, so we sort of set some kind of a power, but this is what truly should have been part of the power. This is the only thing that should have been part of the power in, in the power section. And that is we believe that 40 participants per group is enough or achievable size of recruitment. That's how much we can get in those two years that study was designed for. And at the same time, large enough to detect or encounter any problems with recruitment, with randomization, with retention, with assessment procedure. All these issues that we want to sort out in that particular pilot study. That whole power of the pilot study power section should have been about this blue thing. Everything that is there before, it's kind of, you know, satisfy everyone else just in case we encounter different guys. Now, last two minutes. What happened? Uh, what po ideal power section should be? Uh, we want to say that everything we estimate will be with corresponding 95% confidence interval. No p-values. I don't care about the p-values because, of course, it's not going to be significant. You cannot power in a pilot study. Then we don't want to put any power calculation because that pilot study will be underpowered. That's the definition of the pilot study. We want to have outcomes that will be about all these safety, feasibility, acceptability, or tolerability, those outcomes should have a 95% confidence intervals. Those could be quantitative and qualitative outcomes. And, you know, sample size of the pilot study should be large enough to assess those outcomes, nothing else. And here is again that, that table of those outcomes. If I had more time, I would talk about it. What I want to show you is what happened. So in June 2015, our first reviews. Impact score 44, my collaborator allowed me to show it to you. And uh, here are the relevant reviewers' responses. We were kind of excited. They said, well, we need to do more about feasibility and, you know, all this, like, sort of what should be R34 about. So we said, great, we resubmitted, we added an additional AIM3 on feasibility, which was very important. We talked about it a little bit more, but we left the power section as it is because, you know, don't fix what's not broken. Um, 2016, we got reviewer number one who didn't understand what power is for. Not only he sort of said we have to estimate how the power in placebo group will, well, but that's why we have the pilot study. We don't know what's going to happen. So we're not going to estimate for the pilot. Like, how can we, you know, this is. And additionally, he wanted to split the population, those 80 people, into sort of tribes and do a statistical power for each of the subset of those 80 people. So we didn't do anything. We basically just explained, nope, not doing that. This is confused. So. This summer, we got the third review. Don't ask me how we three times resubmitted. Uh, impact score 39. And look at the reviewer number one. We got a different number one reviewer. And reviewer number one said. He quoted, or she quoted, not Donald Kramer, the 2006 article, and said, don't do any power. Don't do anything else do a uh, tolerability, feasibility, and so on, because otherwise this is not going to work for you. So I was extremely happy. Um, that made me super excited. Of course, uh, actually we got the money now, so now the, the grant is starting very soon. But this is what it, what the reviewers are slowly changing, and we really pilot studies are about tolerability, feasibility, safety, randomization, nothing else. We got another review just two days ago with a different pilot study, 21, and the first review was perfect. It is all about feasibility, nothing about power. So the reviewers are changing, hopefully. Everything is going to get better with the pilot studies, and we'll start using pilot studies for what they're supposed to be used for. So I'm done. I'm sorry it took so long. Thank you.